to a peach university that he needs to do. And so, hey, a few weeks we start a new series called Parenting Things. Not Stranger Things, but Parenting Things, right? And uh, we live in a scary world to raise kids, and kids can be strange, right? And so we're in this series, whether your kids are little or whether they're adult kids, it's for everybody. I encourage you to be here for this series. Today we continue our series, Recession Proof. Uh, a lot of people are living in fear right now because of rising uh, taxes and inflation, and uh, economists are expecting a recession. Even consumer confidence is down really low, and so we're worried about that. Uh, finances are one of the top causes of divorce and struggles and relationships, so it's important to talk about this subject, right? And so I wonder where you are financially. If you're taking notes this morning and uh, you might like, if you think your finances were up and to the right, uh, put like an up arrow on your notes. Just draw an arrow up. And if you think your finances are kind of down to the left, <laughs> you put a down arrow because you need to really focus on some things. If you think you're sitting next to someone who's your financial problem, put an arrow to the left or to the right, okay? And so uh, <clears throat> we cannot ignore this issue. The Bible does not ignore it. The Bible talks, like Jesus talked more about finances and possessions than he talked about heaven or hell. The Bible talks more about finances and possessions than it talks, than it talks about faith or prayer. And so it's a definitely important topic to talk about. And so we are kicking off this series, Recession Proof, we did last week, and we are trying to help you get ready because you cannot predict the future, but you can plan for the future. How can you get involved, right? How can you get involved? If you go to our website, you can either do that by going to our app, and go to our app right now and uh, hit that Recession Proof button. It'll take you right to this page. You can scan this QR code. You go right there. There are three things you can do right now as you sit here in the seat. The first thing you can do is show up on Sundays. You're already here, okay? So you're already doing number one as you learn biblical stewardship on Sundays. Second thing you can do is actually sign up for Ramsey Plus. Ramsey Plus, and we're paying for it. The church is paying it for it for you, so please use it. It is a great, great tool, and that's the number two box. You see that little blue button above number two? You click on that, the code's already there for you. You basically complete your profile, and you'll get in there, and you'll see all kinds of things uh, where you can actually learn and, and get your money in order. And the third thing is Financial Peace University. Those classes start this week, right? And we have different nights of the week. And so once you do the one, the two, you have access now to three. And then is get into a class. Join one of our classes. Give two months to this and see what happens to your finances. If you don't want to join one of ours, you can start your own group. Just let us know about that. And so it's important that we actually get involved. If you've already been through FPU, go through it again. Help make a financial disciple. Help someone else with their finances. Somebody left our service last week, talked to me out front, and she said she got out of college with $100,000 in student loan debt. And she took FPU and had it paid off in three years, right? So you might not have 100000 you need to pay off, but you might have a credit card bill that's 24000 or 30000 I'm telling you, it is a game changer. I've gone through it twice. It's helped me both times. I encourage you to go through it. I just sent two kids through college, and we all carry the load together. And so I, I probably need to go through it a third time, which I plan on doing, because it is a great tool by one of the most trusted uh, advisors and finances, Dave Ramsey. If you go back to number two and you actually get into Dave Ramsey, which we're paying for for you, you'll get a page like this, and you'll click on that start button on FPU, and you'll actually get in there. You can, you can pick your classes from that actual page. There are great courses as you scroll down, courses on how to get out of debt, courses on, on, a, on a, how to talk to your kids about money, all kinds of things. Also in the Explore button, all kinds of videos there, how to invest and how to speed up debt retirement. This is a wonderful, wonderful tool you have free access to, encourage you to get involved. We cannot predict the future, but we can plan for it and get everything in a row. Well, today we talk about treasures. You know, as children, we love to go on treasure hunts, and we might have watched Jacques Cousteau and treasure hunting the ocean depths, and for thousands of years, people have been treasure hunters. You have legends, and you have, you have novels, and, and you have movies, and even reality TV shows, right? Behind me, you see on the screen all these reality TV shows that talk about finances, 
right? I mean, they talk about treasures, treasure quest, and lost gold, and the Caribbean private treasure, and diamond divers, and gold rush, and expedition unknown. Some of these have gone on for more than a decade. These, these are very popular shows. Why? Because something about us is fascinated with finding treasure. Well, you might be surprised to know today that Jesus is also into treasure hunting. Right? He's excited about treasure hunting. and In fact, uh, he encourages us to go treasure hunting. He even encourages us to store up treasures. And so today we're going to kind of get back into the teaching of Jesus on this and going back to the sermon he gave 2,000 years ago on the side of a mountain near Capernaum, the region of Galilee, when he gives his most famous sermon in human history called the Sermon on the Mount. Now last week we saw Luke's version of part of this sermon when Luke talks about the parable of the rich fool. Today we're going to look at Matthew's capturing of this sermon and he captures some of the same content but also some different content. And in Matthew 6, 25, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Remember last week, Luke said the same thing, recorded the same passage, the same statement. And in the verses that follow, Jesus talks about things we tend to worry about. What we're going to eat, and what we're going to drink, and what we're going to wear. We worry about material possessions. And we have stress about this, and Jesus talks about that. Luke records it, Matthew records it. And the question is, why do we have such financial fear? Jesus says, do not worry about material things, and yet all of us, and we've all been there, I'm back there with you, we have been concerned about financial things, and we have financial fears. Last time we saw, as Luke recorded for us, in the parable of the rich fool, that we often believe that life equals stuff, right? And that's how we keep score. We keep score with stuff. It's like the game of Monopoly, right? The game of, we had this game up here last week, and all, and all the hotels and all the houses and all the cash money. And, and uh, the only way to win Monopoly is by acquisition. And the more you acquire, the more you have a chance of winning. And so this is how we keep score in life. We score by acquiring things. In our opinion, stuff equals life. Which is why we have fear, because as stuff goes away, what happens to our life? We're naturally score keepers, and we keep score, and we're constantly uh, trying to earn more and earn more. We saw last week that as, Amer- as Austinites who live in the greater Austin area, we found out last time that, that the greater Austin area has a higher income than most places in the country, and yet we also have higher debt. So it's not, the issue isn't always, I need more money. The issue is, what am I doing with the money that I have? We have this belief that I have to have more stuff, the myth of more, right? This idea that I have to have more and more. It's kind of like our closets that get stuffed full of things, right? This is my wife's closet, Helen, okay? And so, uh, <laughs> actually, it's not my wife's closet, but it's one of your closets. But anyway, um, thank you for the picture. But uh, it's like psychologist Paul Pearsall uh, uh, said humorously, he says, you know, he says, we need to conduct, he says, a closet exorcist, right? We need to somehow cast this out. But he warns us, this psychologist does, that too often when we pull things out of our closet, we make more space. And what do we do with more space? He says, he calls it the restuffing phenomenon, right? And we clear stuff out only to go on restuffing expeditions to the mall, right? Treasure hunting for more stuff for our closet. And it's how we live life. We're constantly trying to get more and more stuff. And so we talked last week about scary stuff. It is scary stuff because we actually believe stuff equals life. And if we lose it, we lose life. And it causes financial fear. Jesus will talk about that today. But also, he'll go beyond that as as we see this in Matthew Matthew 6, 25, where it says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. He says, therefore, do not worry about your life. And so he, he's, he's building this, this statement in verse 25 and what he already just said. So based on what I just said, don't worry about your life. And so we're going we're gonna to back up like we, did, like we did last week and see what comes before this statement. We're going we're gonna to back up and see what it's based on. We're going to see one of the classic passages in the Bible on treasure hunting and treasures. 
at midpoint through this famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus changes gears. He was talking about our spiritual private life, how we give in secret, we pray in secret, we, we, we fast in secret, and he switches gears to more of our public life, how we handle our possessions. And if we go back to verse 19, he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. So he was talking about treasures on earth. What is that? That's just stuff, right? It's just the stuff. It's, it's the stuff we can touch and measure. It, earthly treasures are temporary, Jesus said. They're the stuff of life. And he is not saying, by the way, that we should not have any earthly treasures. No, the Bible talks about proper property ownership. It talks about the need to, 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 to have wealth, to, to actually support your family. He's not talking against planning and saving for the future. The Bible talks about the wisdom of savings and investment. He's not talking here about enjoying possessions. No, the Bible says God provides us for things for our enjoyment. He's not talking about any of that. What he's talking about is, and speaking against, and warning us about, and commanding us to be careful about is, do not lay up, treasure up, do not be so focused on things that are temporary. The problem with earthly treasures is not that they're bad in and of themselves. The problem with earthly treasures is, Jesus says, they are temporary. He says here, the moth and rust destroy, thieves break in and steal. Nice clothes are eaten by moths, and nice possessions are corroded by rust. They, they're destroyed, he says. They're, the word means to be consumed, to vanish. Things just vanish. And if they don't rust while we have them, there's still a risk because a thief can break in, he says, and steal them. In the 1980s and 1990s, we might have thought our earthly treasures were going to last forever, but everything changed in 2001 with 9-11 when the very symbol and center of economic power turned to dust in a day. And we started thinking, maybe things don't last forever. Maybe everything eventually deteriorates and rusts away. When my, my oldest son, years ago, he was only 11 years of age, and we were driving and we're, we were parked at a red light behind an infinity, a car of the infinity. And my, my son says, what is that, Dad? I, I said, that car, that's, that car is called the infinity. And my 11-year-old son said something I've never forgotten. He said, that's a dumb name for a car, Dad. No car lasts forever. <laughs> and I thought, my 11-year-old son's smarter than most people in life, church. <laughs> that's what I thought. And, of course, we're sitting in my 1992 Honda Civic at the time. Now, if you're new to our church... You don't know much about the Civic, all right? But I used to talk about the Civic all the time. You always make fun of me about the Civic, right? I drove it till I had over 300,000 miles on it and gave up the ghost, right? I drove that thing, and my kids hated the loser cruiser, right? They could not stand the Honda Civic. <laughs> and we're seeing the Honda Civic, and my son says, he says, no car lasts forever, Dad, except maybe this car. <laughs> and he rolled his eyes in the back of his head. Cars are nice. We have a life churcher who drives a DeLorean, right? That's not me, by the way. <laughs> but I had to get a picture in it, right? It's like, and, and so, I mean, cars are nice, and, and they go back to the future, but they don't last forever. One day, every nice car, every nice truck will simply be a pile of rust. Let me tell you what's not going to happen in heaven. You're not going to walk up to someone and say, what is that? Oh, this is... A pile of rust. This is my infinity rust. <laughs> oh, really? All I have is Honda rust. All I have is Honda rust, right? There's going to be no status attached to the kind of rust pile you have. It's all going to be rust. Jesus says earthly treasures are not bad. They're fine. But know their limitations. They are temporary. They rust. They are vulnerable. If you build your life on that which is temporary, it will not sustain you in this life and definitely not into eternity. There's got to be more. We have to remember the game ends and how the game ends. Last week we talked about that. Last week, remember, we talked about that. No matter how much stuff I acquire, it all goes back 
in the box. You can get all the hotels. All, my mama taught me that when I was young, right? You can get all the stuff you want in Monopoly, but when the game is over, it all goes back in the box. Jesus says there's got to be another way to live than being consumed by earthly things. And in Matthew 6.20 he says, but store up for yourselves instead of being consumed by earthly things. Stir up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal, he says. A treasure in heaven. The Jewish rabbis used to teach that, that a treasure in heaven was that which has eternal significance. And Jesus is not against treasure hunting. He's not even against storing up treasures. He just wants you to have the right treasures. He says, don't store up treasures on earth, but store up treasures, he says, in heaven. Heavenly treasures are eternal. They are eternal. They're not just temporary stuff. They're God and their people, right? They're exempt from moths and rust. They're beyond the reach of thieves or inflation. He says, That's, there's no deterioration, no depreciation. Don't just focus on earthly treasures. Focus on treasures, he says, in heaven. And let me give you the best investment advice you'll ever receive. Jesus says here, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. If you're going to make an investment, it's okay to invest in earthly treasures, but make sure you are also investing in heavenly treasures. Make sure you're investing your life in God, investing your life in people. Last time I walked around the room, I scared some of you walking around in there, right, walking around among you, and I talked about things that are temporary. I put this sticker, this temporary sticker on your phones, right, on your purses, right, on your car keys, right? This is how we keep score. We keep score by collecting temporary things. But Jesus says, don't consume yourself with this, he says. He said, he says, the temporary is important, but the eternal, he says, must trump the temporary. He says, he says, stuff's okay, but what's more important is God and people. This is how we keep score, but this is how God keeps score. This stuff all goes back in the box. This stuff, you take it with you, right? You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead. You have to invest in God. You have to invest in people, not just in stuff. Don't just store up or focus on temporary things, earthly things. Store up and focus on eternal things, he says, heavenly things. So my focus determines my treasure, Jesus says. What do you focus on? You focus on this, you focus on this. Because what you focus on will determine what you treasure. If Jesus Christ today was to do an audit of your life, what would be your treasure? Many of us are practical atheists. We say we worship God, but we really are consumed with earthly temporary treasures. Let me give you the ultimate insider trader tip, right? The currency of this world will not last in the next world. And if you talk to market timers, market timers are investment experts who read the signs of the market, right? And when the market's about to take a downturn, they tell you to switch your funds into another vehicle that will last through the downturn. Jesus was the ultimate, foremost market timer. He says, this stuff's not going to last for long. He says, you better start finding another investment vehicle. And that's what this is. Your life cannot just be revolve, revolve around stuff. It must also be focused and primarily be focused on God and people. Nothing wrong with stuff as long as you know it's temporary limited. But focus on God and people, he says. Because only this will last forever. Which is why Colossians 3.1 says, Since then you have been raised to Christ, set your heart on things above. Yes, you live in a temporary world now, but your heart can go on and go above, he says, into the eternal realm where Jesus Christ is. Set your heart there. You say, I need the, the right focus. I need the right focus, but how do I get the right focus? Right? All this stuff on earth will be left behind, right? When we leave, all we invest in heavenly treasures will be waiting for us when we arrive. But how do we have the right focus? He goes on in verse 21 to talk about that. For where your treasure is, he says, your heart will also be. 
The where of your treasure, the focus of your treasure is where your heart is. So my heart is determined by my focus. My treasure is determined by my focus, but my focus is determined by my heart, Jesus says. Your heart drives what you focus on. Now, we all know that intuitively. I think we're aware of that. If I was through some devious means to take your credit card statement and post it on this screen, how would you feel about that? Well, some of you would feel uncomfortable. You'd feel exposed. You'd feel violated. That's a personal matter, you would say. Well, why do you say it's a personal matter? Because you intuitively know that how you spend your money reveals something personal about you. You would not just be seeing numbers. You'd be seeing values. You'd be seeing your heart. The reason we get apprehensive about being stripped financially is It reveals our heart. The where, the focus of our money is driven by our hearts. And we have a lot of faulty beliefs in our hearts. We believe that wealth can bring us satisfaction, right? We treat shopping like an antidepressant, right? I'm depressed, let me go shopping, I'll have satisfaction. We believe that wealth will bring us significance. We think our net worth is attached to our self-worth. That's all in our heart. We believe that wealth brings us security. We know it doesn't, though, but we we have these thoughts in our hearts. Jesus is really clear here. Spending is a hard issue. Jesus says, show me your checkbook, show me your visa statement, show me your bank account, and I will show you your heart. We have to watch what we set our hearts on. It should be on things above. He goes on here to use the analogy of the eyes. In Matthew 6, 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. If your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then light, if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? He said your eyes provide light for your path. If you have good eyes, it provides light for your path. You have clarity on where to go. You have the right focus. He said if you have bad eyes, he says you don't have the right kind of light. How great is the darkness? You do not have clarity. You do not have the right kind of focus. In the Bible, heart and eyes were used interchangeably to talk about the focus of our lives. Psalm 119, 10, I will seek you with all my heart. Verse 15, I will fix my eyes on your ways. In this Hebrew parallelism, heart and eyes are equal to one another. And Jesus was doing the same thing here. Just as our eyes give us direction and focus, so does our heart give us direction and focus. And so what I set my heart or eyes on determines the focus of my life. This is why when you're shopping for a new automobile, you start driving around and you start seeing the make and model of the automobile everywhere you go. You ever notice that? There's one, there's one, there's one. You know why you start to, you know why you're now focusing on it? It's in your heart. It's in your eyes. And because it's in your heart and your eyes, you start seeing it everywhere, right? Because the heart, the eyes, they determine the focus of our lives. Well, I need the right heart then. But how do I get the right heart? In the final statement, Jesus says in verse 24, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. In one of the most powerful statements in all of Scripture, Jesus says in no uncertain terms how powerful money is. He says that the pursuit of Christ is not the focus of your life. If your heart is not set on Christ, it will most likely be set on material gain. That is how strong the material gain is. My God determines my heart. My treasure is determined by my focus. My focus is determined by my heart, but my heart is determined by my God. He says no one can serve two masters. No one can. He says, can. You cannot. He says, you have no choice here in the matter. It's a slavery term, he's saying basically here. It requires requires undivided loyalty. 
Two masters don't own one slave, he says. It is, he says, absolute ownership by one master to one slave. Either you'll hate one, love the other, be devoted to one, despise the other. A Hebrew idiom that basically says that you're going to prefer one much more than the other one. You cannot serve both God and money. Or some old translations say God and mammon. Mammon is an error. Uh, is an old Aramaic word. It really means initially to entrust something to a bank, to entrust something into a safe deposit. But over time, it went from trusting something to a bank to trusting in the thing itself. And mammon became a word for God, a God of money. You're going to serve the true guy, he says, you're going to serve the God of money. And greed will growl and greed will groan because it wants to be your God. And money can easily be an idol for us. The Apostle Paul called it idolatry. Colossians 3, 5, put to death greed, which is idolatry. If God is not the central value of your life, stuff probably will be. All of us are born natural worshipers. We will worship something. If we don't worship the creator, we will worship created things. In Romans 1, the Apostle Paul is talking about what happens to a fallen humanity and how they act. In Romans 1, 25, he says, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and created and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. We will worship created things. We'll worship mammon instead of Jesus. Money instead of Jesus. My relationship with money all comes down to what I worship. Do I worship the true God or money, which is a God? Both demand absolute loyalty from you, by the way. It all comes back to what you worship. And this is our problem, is it not? Money is supposed to be our servant, right? We're to make the temporary servant to the eternal. The temporary should be servant to the eternal. Money should be our servant, but for many of us, money has become our master. And God, of all things, has become our servant. God, give me this, and God, give me that, and God, bring it to me quickly. We order God around like he's our servant, and he wants God to bring us our master, which is money. we got to flip the script, Jesus says. The biggest determiner of how you will spend your life, the biggest determiner of how you invest your life is what you do in terms of your worship. My God determines my heart. My heart determines my focus. My focus determines my treasure. If you got the wrong treasure, you need to Pay attention to your focus. If your focus is wrong, something's wrong with your heart. If your heart's not right, you're worshiping the wrong God because God is the one who forms our hearts. It all goes back to what we worship. If I can be brutally honest this morning, I would just simply say that many in this room would have to admit that our God is money. You've not been singing praise songs to money the past 20 minutes or so, but I guarantee you, for many of us, it is. And I'm so, let me tell you this. And I don't say this to, to heap judgment on you. I say it actually to encourage you that money is not worth your worship. Possessions are not worth your worship. Why? Because they do not satisfy. Why? Because they are temporary. They are fleeting. They will not come through for you. The psalmist talked about idols that we create and what happens when we go through a difficult season? Psalm 115.4. But their idols are silver and gold. Their, their, their God is money, he says. They have a mouth but cannot speak. They have eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear. They have noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel. Feet but they cannot walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. All these false gods, including money, are impotent 
incompetent, incapable. And if we trust them, we will become impotent, incompetent, and incapable. Because we become like our gods. Only God can be trusted to come through for me. Anybody believe that today? Only God can be trusted. Not the false gods that we give so much allegiance to. Only the true God. The God of money will be shaken in the next 12 to 24 months. The question is, will you be shaken with the God of money? Or will you be so detached from the God of money and so committed to the true God that when everything's shaken around you, you stand firm because your God is firm. You trust in him. You learn to be content in him. You know, the apostle Paul was only human. Jesus was fully God and fully human. But Paul was only human. He had to learn to trust God, learn to be content. I'm going to just read a few passages from Paul over you. Let let these words sink into you this morning. 1 Timothy 6, 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we'll take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich, and the word here means a drive, a desire, an ultimate compulsion, not just a a wish, but a, a strong compulsion to get rich, fall into temptation and a trap, and to many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into destruction. When you chase wealth, he says, it is a trap. It is something that will destroy you. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money is not evil. Money is amoral. It's neither good nor bad. Can be used for good, can be used for evil. Money is not bad, but it is the love of money. Being driven by money that is the root of all kinds of evil, he says. Some people, what kind of evil? He gives an example. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. They've worshipped money instead of God. They've wandered from God, wandered from the faith to pursue money. And now their lives are full of grief. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. Isn't that a good word today? Put your hope in God. Trusting God is the key to contentment. You know what the word contentment means? It means to be self-contained. That's what it means to be self-contained. Where you will basically live a life that you're not overly influenced by outward external circumstances. Why? You're self-contained in Christ. Christ is in you. And so all the outside forces don't affect you as much. Command those who are rich to put their hope in God. You know he's talking to you today? Well, pastor, I'm not rich. Oh, yes, you are. Did you know if you make over $1,800 a year, which is probably everyone in this room, maybe even teenagers, you're in the top 20% of the wealthiest people on the globe right now. If you make $25,000 a year, you're in the top 10%. If you make $47,000 a year, you're in the top 1%. In other words, if you make over $47,000 a year or $47,000 above as a household, You are richer than 99% of the other people living on this planet. And yet the evil one convinces us that we don't have enough. You're in the same wealth category as Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and Warren Buffett. You are, I don't feel like a pastor. Well, you are. (laughs) By biblical standards, you are. I guarantee you, everyone in this room is richer than anyone in Paul's audience. And he says, you rich people. You people who have things, he said. As America, we live in a wonderful country that's filled with riches. And we have listened to the lie of the evil one that says we don't have anything. The problem is we just want too much stuff. But we really have enough, don't we? How can we be more self-contained, relying on Christ within us? 
I'm not talking about when I talk about contentment. I'm not talking about complacency. It's okay to want to raise. I'm not talking, but I am talking about we should not be consumed with things. We should not be consumed with things. Philippians 4, Paul talks more about being content. 4.11, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content. And in every situation, whether fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want, even when I had nothing, he said, I was self-contained. Even I know uh, external riches, I had, I had no worries. I practiced the way of Jesus. I didn't worry why he goes on to say i can do all things through him who gives me strength we love that passage don't we i can do all things through christ who strengthens me we that we post that all around our house we don't realize the context is about contentment got really quiet in here when everything dries up on the outside it is christ within me that's self-contained I can do all things through Christ who is in me, regardless of what's happening outside of me, he says. In verse 19, and my God will meet all your needs according to his riches, the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. God can be trusted. God can be trusted. As I trust him, he'll meet my needs. And Jesus ends by saying this in Matthew, going back to Jesus in Matthew 6:25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. We already read that part. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Don't worry. The word worry means a divided mind. It's a great description of worry. A divided mind. A mind focused on the temporary things and the eternal things. One eye on temporary, one eye on eternal. We have cross-eyed. Our minds are crossed. Our hearts are crossed. Her eyes are crossed. He said, don't have a divided mind. Only have a single focus. What should the single focus be, he says? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. His kingdom is his will. His righteousness is, is his way. And then God will not overlook the legitimate needs you have. All these things will be added to you. All these things. God promised to meet all of our needs, not all of our greeds. And we trust him. This is not on your outline, but you might want to write this down. God is the source. Everything else is only a resource. You know that sink into you. God says, if you make my will, you make my way, my kingdom and my righteousness, if you make that the priority of your life, he says, I will assume responsibility for meeting your needs. I will be your source. You thought your job was your source. That's why you stress out when you lose your job. You thought your money was your source. You thought your, your possessions, those are all resources. They're interchangeable. One job here, one job there. But the source behind every job, dollar, and possession you have is Jesus. He is the source. The issue of consumerism is not so much selfishness or greed, but a lack of faith. That's my issue with consumerism. Is the selfishness bad? Yeah. Is the greed bad? Yeah. But the worst part about consumerism is it, people who are driven to consume, and they, don't, they lack faith. They forget that God is their source. They're not trusting God for their contentment. On our dollar bills, it says, in God we trust. It's our national motto, in God we trust. Do you trust God? Think about this. On the money itself, on the money, it says in God we trust. And let's be honest, most of us trust the money, not the slogan. Can we flip the script today? Not live in financial fear. Oh, that money's just a resource. God is the source. I don't trust the resource, but I trust the source. Do I trust God is a question we ask. Romans 10, 11, anyone who trusts in him will never be disappointed. Trust in him.